Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Fun and Games Podcast. I'm Jeff Moonen. And I am Matt, a.k.a. Stormageddon. And this episode, we wanted to talk about sequels, because video games as a medium have been around for a couple of decades, and some franchises have, have been around almost as long as video games themselves. And so some franchises have had a lot of iterations, but in particular, Matt and I want to talk about only the second game, because that's kind of the big one. Yeah, the idea also behind it is like in the past, we have talked about reboots and reimaginings, which you know, for some games can be considered follow-ups, I suppose, of course. But this idea is like, the first game came out, it was the first of its kind. What did its next installment do better, different, the same, so on and so forth. And like, there have been enough games around long enough that there are sequels of sequel series. I mean, you have to look at, you know, like for Super Mario Brothers, for example, you know, you have... Super Mario Land and Super Mario Land 2. Super Mario Brothers and Super Mario Brothers 2. Super Mario Galaxy and Super Mario Galaxy 2. You know, true. Super Mario Galaxy 2 is actually, you know, 7 or 10 or whatever in a line of games, but it is a direct sequel to a new version of Mario. Whereas going all the way back to Super Mario Brothers 2, the US version, was A, the first sequel to be different in the US than it was in Japan, and it was because of that it was wholly and completely different like if we talk about what's now considered in the US as the lost levels that was a direct sequel to Mario Brothers 1 it was the same game but harder more diversity of levels new enemies but for the most part it was the same exact game another eight worlds of the same kind of stuff just much harder whereas Super Mario Brothers 2 that we got here in the US was a reskin of Doki Doki Panic and a completely different game. It threw almost everything from the original game out the window. They kept a couple uh they kept a little bit of the window dressing, really. Yeah, like the four heroes are all characters that came from the previous game and then, you know, mushrooms. The, the mushrooms and one ups and coins. Yeah. Other than that, and and it's e- really easy to forget because a lot of the enemies introduced in Super Mario Brothers 2 USA are ubiquitous within the Mario franchise now. Yeah, yeah, there are mechanics too, like the POW block, which is now in everything. It's in Smash Brothers, it's in Super Mario Maker, and it has been in other Mario games, but that was the first time it had really been utilized as a throwable weapon. Right, it was in the original Mario Brothers uh, arcade. Right, but but, but yeah, it was right. stationary this, this was, then. Right, but, it, and, but Mario Brothers 2 is also an interesting thing because... At that time, video games in America were started. Were this was after the video game crash of 1983. Uh, the the story of how Nintendo like tried to eke its way back into the American market is very well documented and easy to find. But I think we got something like the Doki Doki Panic reskin because they weren't sure whether or not American audiences would want the same game over and over. So the NES in particular has a number of well-known franchises where the second entry is now historically considered a black sheep of the franchise because they went wildly off the rails. And it was sometimes decades before those ideas were came around again, if at all. Yeah, I mean, when you think about it, the Nintendo, the sequels of the Nintendo era, like um, Simon's Quest for Castlevania and uh, Adventure of Link for Zelda, both of those mm-hmm. were wildly different from the originals you know um especially zelda which like didn't bring anything back from the first game except the characters and some of the enemies but the graphics the style the gameplay all of it was different whereas in simon's quest like the the core gameplay is the same but now there are rpg mechanics and and towns and dialogue and like which is sort of what they did in adventures of link too right um those two games are similar to each other, actually, more than their original franchise predecessors. Uh, and the other interesting thing is the fact that both of those franchises, Castlevania and uh, Legend of Zelda, have baked into their lore that there are several heroes, and so you can jump around in time. There's the whole infamous Legend of Zelda timeline. Dracula rises every hundred years, so it's always different Belmonts. But one of the other ways that those two sequels are so different from the rest of the franchise 
was the fact that they kept the same hero. Adventures of Link is a direct sequel to the first Legend of Zelda. Right. Uh, Castlevania 2 is Simon Belmont dealing with the curse from the first game. And while those particular iterations of heroes have been revisited since, it's almost uh, more out of the ordinary when it's a direct sequel rather than just a new incarnation. Right. Whereas with our American version of Super Mario Brothers 2, canonically, it was considered a dream. Like Mario wakes up at the end of the game and he was dreaming the whole thing. But yeah. that said, characters from that game then appear in later iterations of Mario with almost no explanation. I mean, think about the Shy Guys who have been super mm -hmm. prominent in the Yoshi's Island games and in, you know, many of the offshoot games. Paper Mario, yeah. Paper Mario. Are They're the only enemy in uh, Color Splash. Right. They're considered canon, but there's never an explanation as to how they become a reality unless, you know, it's explained that Mario was dreaming about things that were real as well. It, it, it And I appreciate that there's no real clarification yeah. it's just kind of exists as it is that tracks with dream theory why not <laughs> but then there are other nintendo sequels that are more or less more of the same with minor tweaks i mean one of my favorite all-time sequels is Mega Man 2 and it's the Mega Man game that brought me into playing Mega Man regularly 2 and 3 and 2 added a couple more robot masters um you know made the stages a little easier mm-hmm but other than that, the the gameplay is identical. Like we don't get the charge shot to the third game or Proto Man game. or anything. Like all we get in the second game that's new is additional robot masters and the difficulty tweaked. Beyond that, it's more or less more of the same. It yeah, all it did was set the pattern for every game after that. It didn't really add much. Just just you know, just set the entire pattern. But <laughs> but that is kind of the other big kind of sequel, and why in particular uh, when I brought this up, uh, when, I, when I talked to, with you about wanting to tackle the subject, Matt, um, this is the kind of sequel I had in my mind where it's the, if all we had was the original game, it'd be an interesting footnote, but it was the second entry in a franchise that made it blow up, that codified things, that solidified what was good and improved what was lacking, that was what made it an institution one way or the other. And it's nice to go back to the first entry every now and again, and, every, and it will always have its fans, but, you know, that sort of start with the second one. Uh, Mega Man 2 is an excellent example of that. Uh, I mean, name me people that play that are huge fans of the original Street Fighter. Right. I was going to say Capcom has set a standard for that because Street Fighter 2 was not only so much better than the first one, but was so ubiquitously loved both in arcades and on home consoles that they remade and re-remade that game many, many times. Fre freshly and years later. It not, it not only uh, codified the series, it codified the genre. Yeah. So. So it's kind of one of those things that like uh, it, Street Fighter 2 is sort of a Terminator 2 situation. Yeah, where people rarely recall the first or are fans of the first. In and the they're not bad per se, but... But it's the sequel that people are truly fans of. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting to look at games like that. I mean, I would even consider more modern games like Assassin's Creed 2 and Crash Bandicoot 2 to be the same thing. You know, Yeah, there's a reason Ezio has his own trilogy within the Assassin's Creed saga. Yeah, which then loops back to Altair at the end of his own trilogy. But yeah, Assassin's Creed 2 spawned a trilogy of games, and it wasn't until a new character was introduced many years later that they made a proper third game in their nomenclature, which is almost irrelevant for some of the sequels, you know. And then Crash yeah. Bandicoot 2 is often uh, lauded as the best Crash Bandicoot game because it took everything the first game did right and added some things to make it almost perfect. Yeah, no argument for me. Uh, I do love Warped. Warped is great. Yeah. But Cortex Strikes Back, Crash Bandicoot 2 is my favorite out of the uh, PlayStation trilogy. It's the one I go back to the most, and it was probably because it's the one I spent the most time with. But I'm even nostalgia glasses off. It's it's head and shoulders above the first one, and it's it, yeah, I agree. It's it's the best of the three. Yeah, for me, no, for me, it is. No, absolutely, and I'm I'm in the same place. I mean, I got way more familiar with them with the Insane trilogy that came out recently, um, mm -hmm. which they are more similar across the board. But it's still, which makes yeah, they're, it's a great long adventure. It's wonderful, right? But it is still clear that the sequel is the better of the three games, um, right? 
you know, and then there are sometimes there are sequels that are handled in a completely different way. I want to go back to Game Boy for a second. Look at the Pokemon series, you know, yes, where it's not necessarily sequel game, but sequel games as the second it's by generation. And the fact that we got a whole second generation of games, gold, silver and crystal, which Mm -hmm. added a lot to the series, including more Pokemon. Now, the Pokemon, the gold, silver crystal is a very interesting one. I'm glad you brought that one up since it sort of, it did a little bit of both of, of both of the kinds of sequels we've been talking about because it, it was very much red, blue, yellow, but bigger and more. Mm-hmm. Like there was the day and night cycle. There was different vehicles you could travel around on. There were addition. There was gender and breeding and different mechanics, so that it was you could get more into the collection and gotta catch them all about it. And were able to program in the Kanto region, so you could go and revisit that game that you fell in love with which was at the time, certainly in America, the only mainline Pokemon titles. I only say this, because, say American, because we didn't have green. But it was essentially like, you can go back and revisit the entirety of the Pokemon saga thus far. And it's another one of those, historically, it's easy to forget that before Gold, Silver, Crystal came out, Pokemon was very much considered a fad. Yeah. Like this idea of, okay, yeah, you kids really love your Pokemans, and... You're you're gonna forget this in a week, and like, why am I spending all this money on this? Gold, silver, crystal was the most like its previous iteration in a way because it built on it. I mean, you could argue about the iterativeness of the Pokemon franchise, but gold, silver, crystal distinctly built on the Kanto games, even baking it in, and allowed everyone to be to see, oh, this can have longevity. And then from there, they get introduced the Hoenn region the, and everything else. And then they went wildly off in a way. But Gold, Silver, Crystal was what locked it in. Yeah, and it's pretty common in gaming for games to be sequels outright, which is just, you know, these are clearly a follow-up to the previous game, like a lot of the games we talked about before. And then there mm-hmm. are sequels that tend to be more... Um, like spiritual successors, like uh, one of the most div- uh, dis- d- divisive ones that I can think of is Chrono Cross, which is ah. considered a sequel to Chrono Trigger, but not really. Like some people th- say it is, some people say it isn't because take pl- te- technically it takes place before, so it's a prequel, but it was clearly a follow up. And but was time linked. travel and alternate worlds, so right. it's a prequel, a sequel, an interquel. It's it is the omniquel. And Chrono Cross is an omniquel <laughs> to Chrono Trigger. And universally, uh, uh, quite frankly, universally hated amongst a lot of diehard Chrono Trigger fans. Now, I haven't played Chrono Cross in a long time. Uh, my memories of being dissatisfied with it come from a very mechanical place of I was annoyed that you busted your ass to get all these awesome summons and really cool abilities. And then when you started the new game plus... Um, you didn't get to keep a lot of that stuff, which is completely the antithesis to what New Game Plus was in the original Chrono Trigger, where you kept everything. Um, But that said, from a story-wise and from a scope size, like this was a PlayStation game. This had better music, more characters. Like in Chrono Trigger, you can get what, you know, eight characters, 10 characters, whereas in Chrono Cross, you could get hundreds of characters, it felt like. I think the, the number is, yeah, it's seven in Chrono Trigger. Off the top of my head, I think it's 44, 45 uh, recruitable characters in Chrono Cross. And there are some characters you can miss. You know, there are mm-hmm. there are all different ways to do the story. It, it just, it's really interesting to look at Chrono Trigger and Chrono Cross as, you know, a sequel to the other. And how they could you I, ostensibly be to separate different games as well. I mean, story-wise, the only thing that links them is a brief thing that happens right near the end of the game. It's not until Chrono Trigger got a re-release on the 3DS, or the regular DS and the PlayStation, where um, Akira Toriyama uh, animated a new cutscene linking Kid, who is one of the main characters from Chrono Cross, back to Luca. But that... That was a postscript on a game that had then come out that they got to iterate on. And and I feel like Chrono Cross, because it's a franchise that has only two entries, uh, it is a little outside of this scope. Yeah. But 
it it also I mean it is it's a great game to talk about for a lot of reasons and it's one that I would love to dive in depth at a future time but it's interesting that the, I look at them as like counter meditations on each other <laughs> I mean and th- that makes I, it's total often sense. been said that and it's often been said that Chrono Cross is a fantastic RPG like one of the best if you can just get over the fact that it's not Chrono Trigger yeah which, as I've made very clear on this podcast several times, Chrono Trigger is one of my favorite games. So I went into that with almost a guaranteed disappointment because Un- you're going to compare it to the thing you love more no matter what. Very understandable. Yeah. Uh, a flip uh, of similar ver- a similar thing to this where you have a long-running franchise is Final Fantasy. Where, because it's a, a franchise that every game is different, you wonder, like, well, w- what's the big deal? We didn't really get to play the original Final Fantasy 2 until Final Fantasy Origins on the PlayStation 1, I want to say. And you get to see just what a wildly different game it is. Because whereas Final Fantasy 1 was a glorified D&D campaign with classes and experience points and everything, Final Fantasy 2 is a story-based game that has no experience points. None. All leveling and progression is based off of what you do. If you get hit a bunch, your hit points will get higher. If you attack with any weapon, you will get better and better with that weapon. Cast magic, you will get better and better with magic. So if you are, if if the grind is real for you, you can break this game wide open, which is cool. And I think it also pertains to this discussion because Square never did anything like that again with Final Fantasy. It was such a different thing. They went, can you make a different series with this? And that is what was the the beginning of the Saga franchise. It was such a wildly different sequel. It veered off into another franchise. I think that's spectacular. The and I mean it stayed technically Final Fantasy because the first three the first three Saga games were the Game Boy Final Fantasy Legend games. And speaking of Pivoting within the Game Boy, I believe you mentioned Super Mario Land a little earlier. I did. Yes, and whereas Super Mario Land 2 is different than Super Mario Land, because Super Mario Land was radically different from the mainline series, and Super Mario Land 2, Six Golden Coins, was more in line with the the NES games. The really interesting part was when the third game happened, and I'm going to go outside my own purview here as well, so... Uh, with Wario Land. Yeah, Wario Land is actually built Super Mario Land 3, Wario Land. And it's not until Wario Land's sequel, Wario Land 2, on the Game Boy Color, that they dropped that pre- prefix. Yeah, so you co- sort of had the second game with Wario in it was you now play him, but it's part of this franchise, and now we'll make a second game that solidifies the franchise. That is a very odd interconnected family tree. Yeah, well, I mean, Wario is born out of the Super Mario Land series and then got his own series. But when, you know, also names sold a lot of things. And so at that point, Mm -hmm. to sell Wario Land, they wanted to be like, hey, remember how much you loved Super Mario Land uh, 2? Well, Wario Land is like that, but better. Right. And that was where they started codifying who Wario is separate from Mario. Like more about collecting the treasure than about saving the world more about uh, bruteness and strength than uh, a given value of acrobatics. But, I mean, let's let's face it. Mario is an acrobatic little shit. <laughs> yeah. Like, just crazy-like. But, but Wario, while having the high jump, is more of, like, stomps and charges and hits. And those all started in his second appearance in Wario Land, Super Mario Land 3. <laughs> yeah. And and, ah. and it's interesting, like, now we're getting to a, a point where we're talking about sequels and naming conventions. Like, sometimes some games throw naming convention out the window. Like we discussed earlier with Assassin's Creed 2, there was Assassin's Creed 2, and then, Assassin's, then two other Assassin's Creed games linked to Assassin's Creed 2, and then they went to the third game. So sometimes yeah. naming hardly even matters, and then you look at a series like uh, so some more modern series, they tend to use codifiers to seek to 
symbolize the sequel like Uncharted 2, but then it's got a, a postscript on, uh, among thieves. Or like in the Batman Arkham series, it's Batman Arkham City. There's no sequel written into it, even though it is, of course, a direct sequel to the previous game. Yeah. Um, which is interesting to me. Something I like about modern gaming's take on sequels too is because the uh, development cycle of games seems to take longer, although also shorter, depending on your perspective, Mm -hmm. waiting for sequels can be um, hugely difficult. Um, I I would be remiss if I didn't spend at least a little bit of time in this podcast talking about Mass Effect 2, Um, a game that when the first one came out, I, I obviously wasn't a fan of the series because it hadn't existed yet. And... I had been familiar with Bioware, but only vaguely. I hadn't played Knights of the Old Republic yet. You know, I hadn't played Jade Empire. I just wasn't familiar with those games. And so then I play Mass Effect and fall in love with it. Finding out the second one's in development, it felt like I waited forever for that second game to come out. Bought it at midnight, played it right away. Because I had to sit with waiting for that sequel, whereas with other games, I've come to them after the fact, you know... Mm. There's not really, like, there was no wait for Mega Man 2. I didn't know Mega Man was the thing, and the sequel is already out, and I got it as a Nintendo game, you know? Yeah, well, gr- growing up, my first Mega Man game was Mega Man 3, so there were already sequels. Right, and so for Mass Effect, you know, waiting for that game felt like an eternity. You know, it's one of the one of the earliest times I remember following every bit of news on a sequel until it came out. I'm sure there were others, but that one's definitely one of the ones that jumps to the forefront of my mind. And Mass Effect 2 is a game that is pretty universally loved as the best part of that series, which is interesting Mm -hmm. because, you know, there could be complaints made for some of the things they took out or added, like the mining system, which was a pain in the ass, the removal of the Mako, which made exploration a little more narrow focused. Um, But then in the third game, because of the issues with the ending and how, you know, issues people had had with it, the second one still tends to stand out. It has the largest amount of, you know, party members. It has the most missions. Um, And it is one of my favorite sequels and one of my favorite games. But it's interesting to look at how well regarded it is, um, especially considering the trilogy, at least for now, seems to be finite. There will not be another Mass Effect in that main series. We got Andromeda which you can take your opinions on that because that's not what this is about. But like, but there'll, but there'll be no more Shepard. So it seems at least. Um, wh- so it seems. And that's the same with the Arkham series, which is why I brought them up together. Like there were three Arkham games, uh, Asylum, City, and Night. And City still tends to be lauded as one of the best. And it's a, at least for the moment, closed trilogy. Yeah. Well, there is also Origins. Uh, yeah, I forgot about Origins. Yeah, but most people do. I mean, I also sort of don't count it because it uh, was made by a different development house, um, even though it's the same system. But anyway, the point being, though, is that <laughs> major franchises with sequels, you know, don't always follow the rules of nomenclature or how they grow the games. Like Bat- the Batman series, going from Asylum to Night, it essentially took everything that Asylum did and made it bigger. Instead of just being on the grounds of Arkham Island, you are now in a large portion of Arkham City. Yeah, which give- and one could argue, and I think there are arguments that Arkham Asylum is the stronger game for the tighter focus. Right. But also Arkham City does add so much and expands on the system in a lot of fantastic ways. You know, and there's not always a clear which is better for these games too, although in some cases there are. Take the fact of Bioshock 2, which is universally panned because... Um, Uh, Ken Levine, when he was creating Bioshock, he had no intentions of making a sequel. It was a contained story, a contained game. That's how he wanted it. However, of course, their their distributor, um, the wonderful and lovely, I believe, Activision, um, decided, no, we want a sequel. Oh, no, it was 2K. I'm sorry. 2K was like, no, we want a sequel, though. So if you're not going to do it, we're going to give it to one of our other teams, and they're going to do it. And Ken said... Fine, I'm not making it, but you, you you know, whatever, you own it, you can make another one. And they did. And this time around, you play as a big daddy. It takes place before the first game. And it, while I've played them both, and they're both good games, the second one just feels like a retread, beat for beat. 
you know, mm-hmm. you get some new abilities. You you know, there it's there's new locations, but for the foam, f- for the most part, it feels like it's just a complete retread. And for a series or for a game, a franchise where a lot of it isn't necessarily about the gameplay. The gameplay is solid. The gameplay is you know, whatever you like about it. But it's much more about the storytelling and about the exploration and the discovery that goes on with that. And it's what made Bioshock such a big deal at the time and what made it's uh, made Bioshock Infinite such a big deal. It was about the story, not necessarily about the gameplay. And if you have like if you already had solid gameplay, retreading steps is no big deal. The Ninja Gaiden trilogy on the NES, they didn't change much. They're good games. They got it right with the first one. The second one is more the same with some extra power-ups. It's great. But when it's more of a story-based, you, you've got to you got to put a little more care in it, I guess. Yeah, and that's why a ton of people consider Bioshock 2 to not be the true sequel and that Infinite is because Infinite for Infinite, Ken Levine came back. It was the game he wanted to make, you know. And it's funny because... Talking about iteration, I mean, if you look at the classic Mario Brothers series, while one and two are vastly different, three is a return to form being similar to one, and then world is just a continuing on those building blocks, right? Right. They, there is still so much added, and there's so much difference, and you see that now that we have things like Mario Maker, and you realize how much had to get retrofitted, right. but it still is the same general form. Feel. Right. But and then you take and you take the Mario series for the most part, while they're all considered, you know, follow ups within the same series. Um, when we shifted to 3D Mario and got Super Mario 64, there was no direct sequel to that. Super Mario Sunshine, same thing. It was considered a sp- spiritual successor to 64 because there were similar controls. Yeah. And it was in a 3D environment. Um, but then it wasn't until we got to Super Mario Galaxy where people felt like, oh, this is the true sequel to Mario 64 because the controls felt similarly, or at least we thought at the time, and that did get a direct sequel. One of the first of the 3D Mario games to get a direct sequel, which was Super Mario yeah. Galaxy 2, which was, again, iterative, iterative like the early ones. It was more of the same, some new abilities, but for the most part, the only new thing was Yoshi, and that you could use Yoshi a lot. There were a couple new power-ups, I think, too. Yeah, and when you played as Luigi, he had his own stars to get. Right, but... Uh, as a whole, it was more following in the footsteps of being iterative like the old Mario games were. And it's not until now with the Nintendo Switch and Super Mario Odyssey that a lot of people are like, oh, wait, we were wrong. All those other games were not follow-ups to Mario 64. This game is. Because Mario Odyssey plays a lot closer to Super Mario 64 than any of the other games that came after it. But Odyssey but, is still not a sequel. Right, and Odyssey borrows from all of those other games Mm -hmm. moves picked up styles of design uh storyline elements and just everything Uh, it's uh, super mario odyssey is one of those great games that it feels like how you remember the games it built on going back to super mario 64 and trying to control with pinpoint accuracy for me certainly is an exercise in hair tearing frustration (laughs) Odyssey, it just feels so good. Yeah. Which is what Miyamoto, one of Miyamoto's uh, design philosophies is, is. It has to feel good to just move around in the world. Yeah. So Mario is a definite uh, testament to that. For sure. And like there's a lot of speculation now. What's the next step for Mario? Will we get another follow up to one of the other 2D Mario games? Or will we get a Mario Odyssey 2 and get the first proper sequel to a new version of Mario, or will we go on to whatever Mario's next thing is? Um, I would say with the success of the Switch, uh, Mario Odyssey 2 is kind of inevitable, because that's why we got Galaxy 2, is the Wii was so overwhelmingly popular, and Galaxy was so overwhelmingly popular. Um, But that said, they could easily go the DLC route. And again, at this point, though, Mario Odyssey 2, while a direct sequel to Odyssey, is not a direct sequel in the Mario series, because there have been so many games. Because there's been the new Super Mario Brothers series as well. Right. And Super Mario 3D Land and Super Mario 3D World. Like, there are so different, so many different versions of first party Mario games that it's hard to even keep track. I mean, you think we had Zelda 1 and 2, but after that, it was uh, Link to the Past was considered Zelda 3, but it still, at that point, it was subtitle and that was the focus. And that's how Zelda has progressed since. We have not 
not had direct sequels to Zelda games except Zelda 64 and Majora's Mask. Right, and be- because they kept switching up the links, you you would never at this point call Link to the Past Legend of Zelda 3. Right. It was the third game, but it is not Legend of Zelda 3. It is A Link to the Past, which is the saga of that Link, which has a sequel now, Link Between Worlds. Right. But again, they're not going to put a number on that. Right. And then, but then, you know, talking about sequels also, like, it's pretty clear to think, oh, this game coming out, they're probably already planning on the sequel. But not all games are like that. Um, I want to turn our attention to one of my favorite PC games, which is the original Portal. That was a game that was a project um, that a, um, a student of gaming was creating that Valve loved and helped them put out. And yeah. th- it was supposed to be a one-time thing. It was meant to, like, the ending was final. You know, the way it ended was resolved. There was no, there was no need for a second game. It was a beautifully tight package of a game. But then Valve... S- still is. Fa- yes, absolutely. But Fa- Valve, seeing this, how successful it was, wanted to make a sequel. And it's another time where the original creator was like, mm, I don't know that this needs a sequel. And the publisher went, well, we're going to make one anyway. And so they did. And I love Portal 2. I think it's a phenomenal game. But what's interesting about Portal 2 is because of the way the game ended with the facility being destroyed and it looking like Shell just getting away, they had to w- change the ending of the first game, which they did. They patched in a new ending. So now when you mm-hmm. beat Portal 1, instead of the facility just blowing up and it ending, it blows up and Shell falls unconscious as she's dragged away. And that's why in the second game you wake up in a different part of what seems like the same facility. Yeah. Which is, that's kind of interesting. I mean, I've heard of... No, I was just thinking of the fact that... uh, I was remembering the Ender's Game series, the novels, there was uh, edits made from one uh, edition to the next so that it could link it together to uh, Speaker for the Dead. But that's a little outside of the video game purview, but, you know... An ending was changed there, too. Sure. And, I mean, it's not uncommon to have those kinds of things happen, though it's definitely not as frequent as direct sequels. And it was just interesting to me because, again, again, then, of course, Portal 2 brought so much to the series. It added a bunch of characters who were truly funny, voiced by incredible voice actors, Stephen Merchant and J.K. Simmons, both being in that game and playing phenomenal characters. Um, Combustible lemons. <laughs> and then, and then, of course, they added multiplayer, which it, here was actually a lot of fun and was a very interesting concept on how to bring multiplayer to a game like that. It wasn't just kind of tacked on like a lot of other sequels. Um, yeah. And that's a thing. They, we gave, they gave it a lot of care. Yeah. Right. And that's something we haven't actually talked about either. The fact that on iterated games, force feeding multiplayer, which is a problem of modern gaming. Like back in the day when we were all kids, like most consoles were maybe two players, at least initially. So playing mm-hmm. a game for player wasn't even a thought and playing online wasn't a thought. So having multiplayer was like, sure, we'll let you take turns playing Mario Brothers as the different brothers. Why not? That's easy to throw in there. But like, now, you know, with the Uncharted sequels, the Assassin's Creed sequels, uh, you know, uh, and, and many others, they forced multiplayer into those games, and it mostly just felt like an add-on. It was never the reason anybody bought any of those games. I love Metal Gear Solid so very much. Mm-hmm. I have never played Metal Gear Online. No, most people haven't. I mean, some s- people had to have played it. I, I've never met anybody who has, or if they, if I have, they haven't told me. Yeah, you know, and like some of the games had a natural progression for multiplayer that has made sense and has been okay. Like I said, Portal Two multiplayer made sense and worked within the mechanics of the game. You know, that second game ends with Shell finally escaping, and mm-hmm. Glados being creating these robots that will be she'll be able to do run tests on instead, and that's where the multiplayer kicks in. Um, Mm -hmm. And then you take a game, you know, that is designed to be a single player experience, but multiplayer is included in a way that still makes the game um, more inviting. It's the Halo series, Halo 1 Mm. to Halo 2, being able to play the main story with a second player in co-op who is just another stand-in Master Chief who isn't really there in the story. It just allows you to experience the game together with a friend. It was a brilliant way to do multiplayer. They didn't force-feed a second character like this is Master Chief's brother Steve. It was just, 
you experience the game in single player, but with someone helping you out in the gameplay moments, which I think is a great way to do multiplayer. What 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 do you got against Master Steve, man? <laughs> he's a jerk. I heard he's terrible. He just wants to help. Um, Look, he does. He talks a little too much about his micro brewing hobby, uh, but he's a, he's a crack shot, and he just wants to help. <laughs> Master Chief's brother is a hipster from Brooklyn. Oh, ma oh, Master Steve is such a hipster. <laughs> um, you know, and and what's interesting also about the idea of creating sequels and how we grow games as sequels. If you look at the Marvel vs. Capcom series, going back to fighting games, like Marvel vs. Capcom was actually a sequel of Street Fighter vs. X Men, which was sort which was a sequel of Children uh, of the Atom. Yeah, and like, and then Marvel vs. Capcom two essentially was the same as the first one, but bigger, more characters. You could select more characters at the same time. The super moves were more over the top, and then by the time we got to Marvel vs. Capcom three, which was a more modern game. It kept a lot of those things, but it iterated also in a game in a way that made it better. But Marvel's Capcom 2 is the one of the fighting games ever. It, yeah, we had 15 years to marinate in its glory. And it's and, considered the definitive version of that game. Marvel's Capcom yes. 1 is not a bad game, but the sequel not a bad game. is considered the way to play those games. A lot of classic fighting games kind of have that. Uh, I think of Mortal Kombat. Yes. I mean, Mortal Kombat, the original, turned a lot of heads. It made a lot of headlines. Mortal Kombat 2 is so much a better game. And Mortal Kombat 3 is questionable. Has qualities, questionable. Uh, Tekken. The original, it com I mean, Tekken 3 is great, and where Tekken has gone is wonderful. Tekken is one of my favorite fighting game series. But the jump from Tekken to Tekken 2. Oh my god, if in graphics alone... And I'm not normally one to talk about graphics, but compare the models of characters. It's hilarious. Sure. And continuing along the 3D fighter route, I mean, think about the Soul Calibur series. The sequel to Soul Calibur is actually the third game in the series because it was Soul Blade, like, Soul Calibur. Or Soul Edge, depending upon oh, where it was released. Right. And then Soul Calibur and then Soul Calibur 2, which was the third in the series, but a direct sequel to Soul Calibur, which is the nomenclature they've kept since. Mm -hmm. And I played a lot of Soul Calibur on the Dreamcast. When that came out, uh, my friends and I, we were blown away by how arcade perfect that game was. But Soul Calibur 2, man, we put a lot of our lives into that. I mean, And it still stands as a, as a notable game. Yeah, I mean, well, Soul Calibur 2 is an interesting uh, point in gaming history because it's one of the few games at that time that offered different characters depending on where you bought it. If you bought it version on... Version exclusive. Yeah, it had exclusive characters in the roster to only that version of the game. Xbox got Spawn, uh, mm -hmm. PlayStation got Hayachi from Tekken, and then Nintendo got Link in Soul Calibur, which yeah. is still one of which my favorite characters. Which made it the best version. Yes, absolutely. Um and you know, and it's interesting when looking at fighting games, the way they iterate can go a variety of different ways depending on the game. You know, with mm -hmm. Mortal Kombat, it got more gruesome, more brutal, and only continued to get more brutal. Um, whereas Street Fighter, it was new characters, more higher combos, super moves. Um, and then you look at the, the Dead, or, uh, Dead or Alive series, uh, uh, continued to iterate on its surprisingly deep and fun fighting system while getting both more and less fan servicey. Yeah. And and then you look at something like the Super Smash Brothers series. The sequel to Super Smash Brothers, Super Smash Brothers Melee on the GameCube, like arguably is still considered the best Smash Brothers game because It is the tournament standard. Right, because they took what Smash Brothers did on the on the N64 and just made it better. They improved everything, you know. And I yeah, and well, and I think Super Smash Brothers in its original version, it was sort of uh, I'm I'm gonna muddy up the facts here, so I'm just gonna take some broad strokes. <laughs> I, I I feel like learning. I remember learning that it was sort of a like a test, or they were like they wanted to make a fighting system. They wanted to make a fighting game that used this system, and then it was sort of like, well, throw the throw uh, Nintendo characters in there. Like it was a bit of a well, you got chocolate in my peanut butter and kind of thing. And it was just, it was great and it worked. And then Melee was like, all right, we're making a sequel to this idea. Here is what we're going to do. And that's probably where a lot of those codifying second games happened. You know, there was enough success with the first one. It's like, okay, now we've sold, 
enough folks on the idea that we have the resources, we have basically a, a very documented test run of what worked and what didn't. Let's lock this in. And, you know, the, the market on first party and working GameCube controllers is kind of wacky because of how much like Smash Brothers Melee is still a tournament game, one with money and people and a following. It's amazing. Yeah, it really is a fascinating look at how fighting games kind of grow with sequels. And like that said, and with all the talk we've done about sequels, some games don't continue in a in a sequel formula. I mean, one of my favorite game franchises of all time, if anyone knows me at all, is Kirby. Kirby, I love Kirby. Kirby's one of my favorite mm-hmm. Nintendo characters. The original Kirby games on the Game Boy, Kirby's Dream Land 1, 2, and 3, were iterative. You know, they added stuff. Mm-hmm. They added uh, pals that you could ride. They added. They updated the graphics. They added new villains. Um, you know, it was pretty much running in the vein of classic Mario games where they just improved it a little more each time, added more stuff, added power-ups, added abilities. Mm-hmm. But once Kirby got beyond the Game Boy, when he was on the Nintendo, when he was on the Super Nintendo, when he was on especially the DS and 3DS era, it was less about being iterative and more about, hey, what crazy concept can we come up with Kirby? Numbers? We don't need them. It's just going to be mm-hmm. a subtitle, and we're just going to continue to grow this franchise, but in wacky ways. But the original three games were iterative and had the numbers. And yeah. it's hard to know whether that's a conscious decision or not or how that discussion happens, but it's just fun to look at those versions of Kirby and how they grew differently because of how they were named and how they were numbered and how they were viewed. Yeah, I actually think uh, Kirby's Dreamland, the numberings had to do with who was director. Oh, interesting. Which is why Dreamland 2 on the Game Boy and 3 on the Super Nintendo are the only ones that have the Animal Friends in any great amount. Huh, interesting. And it's easy. And it's easy to forget that Kirby's Adventure, the NES uh, version, it was the second Kirby game ever released. Correct. There was Dreamland, then Adventure, and Adventure was what gave us copy powers. In Dreamland, you you were you know adorable friend shaped fluff ball that could eat things and you'd swallow them and nothing gave you powers. You just could eat and shoot and swallow and smile, Poyo. <laughs> and then Kirby's Adventure was okay if you eat certain enemies, you can do their thing. And can you imagine a Cur- like can you imagine a Kirby nowadays that can't do that? Yeah, and what's really funny also, you mentioned Kirby, how his sequel, he was the first Nintendo character to debut on the Game Boy and then make his sequel jump to the Nintendo. That's true. Samus did the exact opposite, debuting on the Nintendo with Metroid and then the sequel only being on the Game Boy. And that doesn't happen a lot. Like, console generations getting the sequel is fairly frequent, but, like, a game debuting on a handheld and then then going to a console and vice versa is very uncommon. And those are the two that I remember specifically. It, it's why I never played Samus Returns, because I didn't have a Game Boy till much later, and so it was just a game I never got. Yeah, that makes sense. And and it's really interesting to look at that and like you I could never imagine Nintendo now taking a series that started on the Wii, let's say, and then only making the sequel for the DS. Like they would never do that. They would sooner release it on both platforms than do that. And Yeah, there's there's been a couple weird little exceptions here and there, like Final Fantasy twelve has a direct sequel only on the DS. Sure. But, but no, you're right. Uh, on the whole, yeah, on the whole, most of the direct sequels are on the same platform the game debuted on, which is really interesting. Also, considering Final Fantasy XII at the time, which was a PlayStation exclusive, the fact that the direct sequel was on the DS is really interesting. Think about Kingdom Hearts, also, where the direct sequel was on the PlayStation Two, but then every other iteration after that was on handheld devices, almost exclusively. Yeah, that- Kingdom Hearts is another example of uh, number sequels are kind of weird. Yeah, like the the fact that Kingdom Hearts 3 on the PS4 is 3 is only by a logic standpoint that they've decided to make up because by all accounts, it's like Kingdom Hearts 8 at this point. I think it's Kingdom Hearts 13. I think it is actually the 13th one. Remember that, like everyone memeing about that. Uh But yeah, that was their way of... Going, this is the continuing 
the continuing story of Sora, Donald, and Goofy doing this stuff. Everything else is like supplementary, fills it in. You follow this other group of Keyblade wielders, like other things. But, you know, you know that it's about Sora, Donald, and Goofy and doing that and very mainline because it is Kingdom Hearts, Kingdom Hearts 2, Kingdom Hearts 3, which also lays bare, as we've been talking about, how arbitrary this is. I love it. Yeah, I mean, and and like the arbitrariness of it, I think also depends on how the different games are designed. I mean, you look at the Mario Kart series. The Mario Kart debuted on the Super Nintendo with Super Mario Kart. Its sequel, Mario Kart on the N64, was just Mario Kart 64. No Super in the name. Technically the sequel. Although yeah. also um, Mario Kart Super Circuit came out around the same time. Right, and it is considered that is considered a game in the series when they finally got to Mario Kart 7, Mario Kart 8. That was part of the counting. And it's funny, it's been about 20 years since we've been able to do that good old joke, Mario Kart 64, I missed Mario Kart 2 through 63. <laughs> oh, you're such a dad. Well, we, we, we all made that joke. That's true. We all made that. Do not hide from this truth. <laughs> um, but it, it's just interesting, you know, and like shifting towards racing games. I mean, like I know uh, Crash Nitro Kart got sequels and they weren't numbered. They had different names as well. Um, you know, and then you've got games like Need for Speed, whereas Need for Speed 2 Hot Pursuit, where they added police chases and you could actually play as the police and chase the racers, mm -hmm. you know. Certain games had, I think, two in the title just because that's just how we make games or because that's a very um, old school way of naming things. Whereas other people are like, no, I want to iterate on this game, but I want to make it a different element or a different color or a different subtitle. It's, it, they're, they're all different tactics of brand recognition. And, you know, where, whereas sports games are typically not going to have, like ones where you have updated rosters for teams, they're not going to tell you what number in the series they are. They're going to tell you what year they are. Right, because it's relevant to the rosters that are on the game. Correct. So, I mean, we never really made those. Uh, I don't remember making those sort of sequel jokes, but <laughs> that's all that. But uh, I'm thinking uh, to kind of circle around for a minute, uh, a sports-ish game that definitely had a classic second version is Tony Hawk Pro Skater. Yeah. And that was a game that was everything the first one was, but more. And I can think of one specific thing that they added that, t that was like the, that's what took the series from good to great. The manual. Yep. One of the big draws in playing Tony Hawk's Pro Skater series was combos, stringing together tricks so that you got a huge score. And... The, a manual is sort of like a grind in, in as far as gameplay mechanics go, but instead of balancing yourself on a surface that you're grinding across, it's maintaining a wheelie, essentially. And as long as you maintain that, your combo continues, your points continue to accrue as you move to another area of the level to do more tricks there. And so you're able to recover better, and you're more easily able to... I remember playing with my friend Sean, and... Him showing me that you could get over a million points in the level. And I, and, and it was mind blowing. I lost my mind about it. <laughs> and it, it's funny how like one little thing, in addition to just more and bigger and better, like it's fun to go back and play the first one. I still play the first one. The second one is like where the series begins and however you feel about where the series went after that. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 is where it begins in a lot of ways. Sure. And, you know, the the iterativeness of, of sequels comes and goes depending on the franchise. I mean, like for me, another sequel that stands out in my head being better than the first was Rock Band. You know, Rock Band was the start yeah. of the full band version of Guitar Hero, which essentially is a spiritual successor to Guitar Hero 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. You know, but and Guitar Hero 2 is also one where like Guitar Hero was, OK, you got the you bought the guitar. Here's a way better game now. Yeah. And this idea that you're taking what the core of the original was and building upon it. And, you know, I don't think that's a requirement of of a sequel, but it definitely doesn't hurt. I mean, you think about um, the Sonic games. Sonic 2 
took what made Sonic 1 great and made it better. Faster, gave you the ability to get moving fast instantly with the spin dash, and top speeds were increased, and the d levels were designed to keep you moving, whereas in the first game, there was a bigger focus on platforming, where you could still move fast, but there was definitely a focus on platforming. You know, and then you think about Sonic Adventure 1 versus Adventure 2, whereas Adventure 1 let you play as many different characters, Sonic Adventure 2 let you play as different, like the light side and the dark side, and naturally cycled through the characters in one giant story. Yeah, and Sonic is kind of what sparked this topic for me. I was watching a speed run of Sonic, of the Sonic 1 re-release on Android phones. And it was one where they brought in quality of life improvements from later games. So Sonic 1, but with a spin dash. And I was watching that and it occurred to me that like, yeah, that is a quality of life upgrade that you go back to the first one and it's frustrating as hell you're like how did i how did i live without this yeah yeah there's tons of people who will go back to super mario brothers one and go this is a fun game this is you know this is mario at its core it's how it started this is a definitive mario game but there aren't many people who will go back to sonic one and go this is the definitive sonic game this is the sonic game i want to play most people cite sonic 2 as the definitive sonic game oh yeah for a lot of reasons, uh, you know, the addition of Tails, I suppose, but also the music, the levels, the 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 additional moves that were made. It was it was the Mega Man two. It was this, but bigger, and it sets the standard. The first one was good. This one, lo it locked it in. Yeah, for sure. But so, Matt, what is your favorite sequel? Doesn't have to be a good sequel, a bad sequel, whatever. What is your favorite second game in a franchise? I mean, I think I think the obvious answer for me is easily Mass Effect 2. Um, I mean, it, it took the first game and just did everything better. It made the story bigger. It gave you more people to play with. It gave you more relationships to explore, more missions, tons of DLC. Um, it just took everything about the first game that was good and enhanced it. You know, it removed some things that some people lament about, not I, because the Mako is trash. I'll say it on every podcast I have. Um, and I will agree with you. <laughs> but yeah, Mass Effect 2 was just an improvement from, from toe to tip. And like, I mean, I guess it's a spoiler still, but like the way the second game starts... Like, it's the, it was the first time I was ever emotional at a video game because I couldn't believe what I had just seen. Um, yeah, Mass Effect 2 is easily my favorite sequel. It's one of my favorite games of all time. It just, I don't, I don't think I can think of anything in the second game that is worse than the first game. Like, the only arguable point is that there's less exploration because you can't land on every planet you know, or multiple planets that, you know, for tiny side missions. But beyond that, like, I think across the board, everything was better in that second game. Nice. That's a great answer. Uh, what about you, Jeff? What is your favorite sequel of all time? I have a feeling I might know, but still, let's, well, let's hear it. Well, there, there is one sequel I want to mention. It's not my favorite, but it kind of, when you were talking about like Bioshock and Portal and Portal 2, I was thinking about it. The sequel to Katamari Damashi, mm. We Love Katamari. Yes. Which is, there's a number of Katamari games, but there were only two that had uh, the input and direction of Keita Takahashi, the creator of Katamari Damashi. He wanted it to, much like Bioshock, he wanted it to be a singular experience and taken on its own. And I especially had a chance to, to revisit that when earlier this year I played and beat Katamari Damashi Reroll on the Switch. What a beautiful and delightful statement, experience, everything it is. And We Love Katamari is a very funny uh, thought experiment on the nature of just being a crowd pleaser and just doing this to please other people. This is what we're doing because the We Love Katamari is built on the story that the Katamari Damashi was so popular and the king has become so popular that everybody wants a Katamari made for them now. So Prince, go make them those Katamaris. And it's a very fun game and one that I love and one that is directly tied to my marriage. Um, I'll just leave that. Uh, I'll just let that be a mystery. That's when you got to ask me in person. It's not gross or weird. It just got to ask me in person. <laughs> yeah. But, 
But that being said, I have come back around to how much I love the original. And I like the other ones too, Katamari Forever, uh, the ones, the handheld ones, they're fun, they're great. Um, I think my favorite sequel, it's not my favorite game, but it is and it's not even my favorite in the franchise, but it is my favorite second entry favorite sequel. Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty. Huh. Yeah. What did you think I was going to say? I, I thought it was going to be either Final Fantasy 2 or Dragon Quest 2 or I don't know, pretty much an RPG of some kind. That's fair. <laughs> and I do love those. And I, li- and I like running around in those. But Metal Gear Solid 2, again, I guess, and I wanted to bring up We Love Katamari because this furthers that idea. Metal Gear Solid was further muddying. It was not the first Metal Gear game. It was technically Metal Gear Solid 3. And it was called Solid, not just because of Solid Snake, but because we were in polygons. So it was solid characters. So it was sort of Metal Gear 3D. And Metal Gear Solid 2 was, okay, we're acknowledging this is the second one. And this was the game that made a slightly strange military opera stealth wacky game just go weird. (laughs) Yes. It is a... It was a big question, a huge question nestled within a question, within an enigma, within uh, the rug being pulled out from under you about what is a game? What is narrative? Who are you? What are you? What do your choices say about you? What does your 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 action or non-action do? A story lasts as long as you still read it. You can end the story by closing the book turning the game off and that is the ending for you just because you can have more story does not necessarily mean you need more but your choice to continue to go through with it why because this is a game and you want to see the end well if you want to see the end this is what's going to happen and it is a strange postmodern origami eiffel tower that sets itself on firewall playing a song you've only heard in your dreams <laughs> i mean like metal gear solid 2 is pretty much the game that was like oh hideo kojima that dude is weird like yeah, we had had it, we had had suspicions before that but that was the first game where you went oh this guy is go- on another level yeah and it's a game that i still find new details and one that i still uh develop new thoughts on on notion of canon and reality and fiction. The very idea that what is real and what is fake within a game that is entirely fiction made up by people. (laughs) Yeah. This is an agreement that we all make. That canon and truth in fiction is something that we just agree to. (laughs) I like that. I like how angry it makes people. I like how angry it makes me. I like how much it delights me. Yeah. It's... I'm happy it exists. I love the outside narrative that it had in the sheer hype that the game had and how they cleverly hid the fact of who you were playing the entire time because your reaction to that, your true, honest, immediate reaction to that was part of the experience of the game and was necessary. I, it's my, it is my favorite second game in a franchise. It is my favorite sequel. It's not my favorite game. My favorite Metal Gear is still Snake Eater, but... Metal Gear Solid 2, Sons of Liberty. Holy shit. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great answer. Uh, talking about uh, subverting expectations. It, it both built on and iterated Metal Gear Solid while also just completely collapsing in on itself. Yeah, it is definitely a unique beast. That is for sure. Um, well, And it brought quality of life upgrades that when they did the Twin Snakes and you saw Metal Gear Solid over Metal Gear Solid 1, you saw how much the game was broken. <laughs> yeah, that is definitely true too. Um, well, for sure, we haven't talked about every sequel that's ever come out, not even every genre that has sequels. But if there are sequels we missed that you want to tell us about, please say it somewhere on the internet where you find the podcast. Or, of course, tell us your favorite sequels. We love to hear what your favorites are wherever you can post that stuff. Um, some really quick housekeeping. Um, as we get closer to September, I still would like to kindly remind you that Jeff and I will be there in official capacity covering a video game con, an event we're both very excited to be at. And we will be doing a, our first ever live podcast at that event as well uh there will be more details on that as we have them but if you're going to be at the con on the 7th and 8th in new jersey 
please reach out to us somewhere on social media. We would love to meet you in person and hang out. Um, I'm very excited to get to do this nonsense in the flesh with an audience. Yes. And as yeah, the uh, a video game con as of when this episode uh, goes live is tomorrow. Yes. So fr- from in the past to to when this episode is, we are very excited to see as many of you as we can in the very near future. And in the meantime, yeah, please let us know. I mean, I, I didn't get to every sequel on my list here. Me neither. Uh, M- Matt and I both made lists. We're like, oh, we're, not, we're doing this. <laughs> because you know what? We want to hear yours. We want to hear why it's important to you. We want to hear your experiences because this is a conversation. Thank you for being a part of it. I'm Jeff Moonen. And I am Matt A.K. Stormageddon. And happy gaming. <laughs>